Hello, welcome to Van Diemen's Land Model Bench. I'm Dan, and to a new video segment I've called Final Thoughts. And in these videos, I'm going to just go through perhaps and show you some of the work I've been doing. Um, maybe I've taken some photographs or some video with them, or maybe I've just just made them. And I just wanted to share with you what I thought of the kit or the product I was using after I finished with it. So I'm going to start this series uh, rolling with this kit, which is the Trumpeter 135th scale German Armoured Train Panzerwagen uh, NR16, number 16. This is uh, a pretty big kit, as I said, 135th scale. It's got a bit over 480 parts, and its total length is, uh, we're metric here in Australia, so you'll have to bear with me. It's 631 millimetres, or 61 centimetres, and it's about uh, 96 millimetres wide. So it's a fairly big model when you're finished and I'll actually put up a picture about now just showing you the finished model next to a 135th scale um, T34 so exactly the same scale kit and that'll give you a bit of an appreciation so put the box down for a moment and there's the model um, normally I'd review these out on my workbench but because um, this kit is so large it is very difficult for me to actually video it out there and also uh, I've got a bit of a head cold today so my workbench isn't heated and I'm, it's a really horrible day here in Tassie. It's very cold and overcast so I didn't really feel like going out there because it was probably going to just get my cold worse and I'm only about a week away from holiday so I didn't want to risk it. So I've got the model here on the uh, kitchen table and hopefully you can see it. I've got as much light in the room as I can. Um, I will put up some photographs at the end of this uh, reflection as well so you can have a look at the final build with some better sunlight on it. Uh, I took some photos out the front of the house when the, when I just finished it, when it was a nice sunny day. So anyway, let's talk a bit about the kit. So as you can see, it builds into a monster of a, uh, of a subject when it's done, and it's pretty darn impressive, I have to say, once it's finished. Um, starting with the instructions, the instructions for the kit are actually really good. I had no problems at all with understanding what I had to do or the sequence in which I had to do things. There was no sort of glaring errors in the instructions at all, so that was great. They were all pretty straightforward. Um, there are a few things about the kit that make it a little bit unusual compared to most of the models that uh, generally most people make, whether you do tanks or planes or what have you, and that is that, uh, for example, you're doing a lot of duplicate parts. Keep in mind that the front of the train here and the back of the train here are identical. So you actually are doing those whole assembly sequences for each end, which are based, these are wagons basically that attach onto the main part. So you have to repeat those twice, which is a bit unusual. And also you've got a lot of things like wheel sets that you've got to make. So you do quite a lot of those. So for the wagons, for example, you'll do uh, a total of eight wheel sets to all together to put, put, put it together. The level of detail in the uh, underframe area is okay. If you know anything about trains it's it is lacking a bit of detail i think the best way to describe this would be what car modelers call a curbside kit which is to say there's a representation of some of the detail that should be there but it's not all there so if you're um, mad keen on scratch building there's plenty of potential underneath the train actually for you to go to town and put a bit more detail in i decided not to because i thought given the scale of the model, it's fairly unlikely that people are going to pick it up and look underneath because it's it's quite a job to do. So I was happy to leave just the standard detail um, and I just applied a little bit of weathering um, there. I did use some AK Interactive metal uh, paints, so I think it was a steel colour, which worked really well as far as um, giving the finish on the wheels. So that was the first time I got to use that on a kit and I was really impressed. And I also used some Pico branded uh, brake dust which was a pigment that worked very well uh, underneath as well. So I was quite impressed with that. And it actually was quite good value compared to the price you pay uh, for some of the other brands that we have in the modeling community. The kit also comes with its own track bed, which is really nice. And that's a feature that um, I wasn't really expecting, but I did elected not to use all of it. So let me just show you why. Let's take this box open. Oh, there's the... Uh, painting guide so we'll look at that in a bit so what you get is several <clears throat> several track sections like this 
And the idea is this has got the, the ballast molded into it. It's got the sides there which is to make it like a nice display. And you would put the sleepers and the track obviously in this. Um, my concern was, if you have a look here, you can just see the joins. It's just got little tabs at each end. My concern was that if I put the put these all together for a start, it wouldn't be particularly strong. And it, there's no way I could lift the model uh, while it was sitting on top of this. It would have just broken apart. So I was having to think about reinforcing these joins and all sorts of things, and that was uh, starting to concern me a bit. The other challenge I thought was, even though this is moulded quite nicely, um, I'd have to paint this and weather it, and it probably wouldn't look quite as good as if I used some model railway products uh, to do the ballasting. So I decided and elected in the end just to have a piece of pine timber here that I just dressed and basically use that as my base instead. And I just used the sleepers and the rails, obviously, on my, my diorama. And if you're going to have to move the model around at all, then I think probably this is the way to go, is to make your own base. You could make the track section shorter, as you can see. There is a bit of uh, length that I'm not using at the end here of the model. I wasn't particularly concerned about that because I actually do have another German flat wagon kit. So at some point, I'll probably add that uh, to the end of the model. So I was okay with the, the length of track that you got with it. But anyway, I still thought it was a very nice touch that uh, Trumpeter do indeed include that if you want it. Um, the rest of the sequ sequence for the assembly, as I said, pretty straightforward. The only part of this kit that I found to be really a pain, um, well there's two I guess, one was fitting the brake shoes. Uh, the way I did the assembly of the model was pretty atypical for sample for someone doing a tank. I basically assembled as much of the kit as I could, uh, first of all just glued it all together and then came back and primed it and painted it. I couldn't put the brake shoes on though however because I needed to put the silver on for the polished end edges of the wheels. So I had to wait till that was done and then fit the um, brake shoes after that. That was a little bit fiddly and it wasn't done in the sequence that um, Trumpet had recommended. So I had a little bit of trouble because I had to sort of fit the brake shoes between some of the other parts of the running gear. But I did get there and it did work, so that was fine. You will have to take a bit of care when it comes to putting the actual framework onto the base here of the wagons because they have to be obviously dead level. So I do strongly recommend before you start doing that, that you at least assemble or at least dry fit some of the rails onto the sleepers so you can test fit that you've got this all level. If you don't, then of course these parts here, these two end pieces actually clip onto the middle bit here. So if they aren't uh, dead level, then you can have a problem with the wheels um, sticking up in, in the air when you finish the kit. So it's not so much a problem as just you've got to be aware of it and make sure that you are checking as you go along before all your glue dries. The other bit that was a pain, and it, it looks great on the model now it's finished, but oh, it was so tedious, was the photo etch. Um, these tiny little hooks that are all over the all over the train are actually photo etch, and you have to glue each one of those, cut them out and glue each one onto the model. And it's really not much fun, I've got to tell you. Um, it's worth doing because it does really make the model pop at the end, but it's no joy to do it and what I did find in the construction was that um, Trumpeter had put some very shallow indentations along the sides where you had to put the hooks in but I found it next to impossible to get those hooks to glue into those positions with just the indentations that Trumpeter had put there for me. So what I ended up doing was using a small drill and drilling out holes wherever those indentations were so I had a little bit more room to work with and then I went and put um, some glue on those spots and then stuck the hooks in. Um, speaking of the glue too, I had, uh, I'm not a terribly experienced with photo etch, so it may have been mining experience, but I had a really hard time getting this trumpeter photo etch to actually stick. I tried two or three different super glues uh, and a jeweler's glue. None of them seemed to work particularly well. Um, all of them seemed to have a little bit of trouble with adhesion. So maybe there's something I should have done to prepare the photo etch parts before I tried to glue them. And I'm not aware of what that is. Um, if you know what I could have done, let me know in the comments. But really that um, was a bit frustrating. But ultimately I was able to get around that by just drilling the holes. And that gave me uh, an area where I could put a lot more glue in. And it didn't detract from the finished model at all. Um, so... I'd highly recommend you do that if you're going to be building this kit. Other than that, construction was pretty straightforward. The instructions were quite clear. And uh, 
there was no complaints there. This was my first trumpeter kit and that was all pretty positive. Oh, there was one other thing, now I think about it too. The axles. The axles are keyed. Um, so the idea obviously is that the wheels should fit a certain way onto these axles, but um, try as I might, I could not get that to work properly. Um, what's supposed to happen is you put the wheel on and then these pieces on the end, which is the axle box, is supposed to actually go on a certain way. And the idea is then both axle boxes will be square for when you put them between the two frames. That is wrong. Whatever they did in the moulding, they did that wrong. Uh, there's no way that you can get that to actually key properly. So I ended up having to file the end of these and then uh, put the ends on and then put them in and line them up by, by eyeball. And that worked fine. It just meant that I had to do all this sort of sequence in one sitting to make sure it was all right before um, the glue dried, basically. But that was that was the only other problem I had with it. So it was a fairly lengthy kit. It was an unusual kit too because uh, of the repetitive nature of it, having to redo the same steps over and over, which is something you're not really that used to. Perhaps tank uh, modelers are a bit more used to that than aircraft modelers, which is predominantly what I am. But it uh, went together pretty well. For um, some of the painting and things, um, for priming it, I used some Vallejo surface primer. And I'm aware this is probably the most controversial modeling product on the planet. It, it, it's uh, got a fair bit of um, airtime on YouTube and in modeling forums. The reasons I decided to give this a go was because uh, with my online supplier here in Australia, um, Vallejo surface primer is probably the cheapest per milliliter surface primer that I could get. But in addition to that, I really like the sort of smooth satin finish that you get from it. Now, I'm not ignoring that people have had a lot of trouble with it, so I'm, I'm sort of in, still in the testing phase, if you like. But I did use it on this model, and it worked very well for me. I know some people have trouble sanding it. I didn't have that experience. But then again, the way I do my modeling, I might put the surface primer on, and it could be several days before I get back to do any other work on the kit. So I think I gave um, plenty of time for the surface primer to to cure and, and dry thoroughly, and I think that probably was the secret. If you're in a big hurry, I could see why um, maybe that wouldn't be your best choice of primer. Uh, initially, I had I did try thinning it, so I used a bit of um, UMP airbrush thinner because I had that around. Um, yeah, it's a generic thinner, it's okay, but I, I tend to use the brand name ones now, uh, the ones that go with the actual paints I'm using, because there are I found there are some differences between different thinners, so. I've just gone into the habit of doing that. The other thing I did use with it too was a bit of Vallejo's uh, airbrush flow improver and that certainly did help a little bit as well. So with those two products thinning it down a little bit, I was able to spray it okay through a 0.3 and a 0.38 um, airbrushes. Later on, I tried um, using uh, my Pash H airbrush, uh, which is a single action airbrush, and I used a number three size needle with that and I was able to actually spray um, part of the model neat just using the surface primer. Now Vallejo do recommend that you actually do spray it neat because uh, that will help with its um, in, its its hardness and, and how it actually uh, is resistant to wear and chipping. Um, but for a lot of modelers, I think if you've got a smaller airbrush needle, you're going to have to thin it somehow. So Vallejo does say if you need to do it, they recommend you use their thinner because apparently they, their um, airbrush thinner does have some resins in it that helps to keep the, the strength of the primer, although they still recommend you only um, thin it down as as little as you need to, basically, to get it to work. So, yeah, whatever. I mean, it does seem to be fine with these ones, and, uh, and the models seem to be fine. I haven't had any trouble with wear on it or peeling or anything like that. So, so far at least, um, had a pretty positive experience with that. But as I said, if my opinion changes, I'll let you know in a future video. So once I primed the whole model, um, then I had a few things I had to think about. For the sleepers here, I ended up using Life Colors wood um, paint set. It came out okay. I'm still learning how to do wood grain. It's something I really want to get good at because I'd love to have a crack at doing some of the World War I biplanes and things that um, had the sort of wood finishes on them. So I've got a little bit of work to do on that, but I've bought a couple of kits to test. So I've got a couple of uh, kits with um, carts in them, like horse and cart, so I can try... Um, practicing the wood techniques. The rails themselves came up just fine. I used um, another uh, life color set which has some rust 
colors in it and I also used a bit of Tamiya's weathering um, system there sort of like a pastel for putting the silver on the top there and that seemed to work fine as well when it came to actually painting the tank uh, sorry the tank the train I should say um, that was a bit of a challenge because here's the paint guide and as you can see it's basically one big giant chunk of Panzer Grey. Uh, there is no real variation in colour except for a little bit of detail around the, um, the buffer beam. So that then raised the question about how I was going to uh, apply the paint and was I going to try and uh, weather it. I did look at doing some of the approaches that uh, are used in the armour side of things because that seemed to be a pretty good match um, for what I was trying to achieve. I didn't weather it as much as what armour modellers do and there's some logical reasons for that. This train doesn't go driving across fields and you know scraping against trees and bits of debris and rubble in towns and villages and things. This runs on the rails and the sort of wear that a train experiences is a bit different and typically it's just um, wear and tear from the elements more than uh, any sort of you know, physical contact with other objects. So as you can see on the finished model I did focus on trying to come up with a technique that will allow me to do that. And with my research I got quite intrigued with a, an approach called um, black and white. Um, and so MIG have a paint set out that allows you to sort of mimic that effect and while MIG isn't my favorite brand and I will be talking a bit more about MIG paints in a future video um, this kit was reasonably affordable so I thought I'd give it a go and uh, it isn't actually too bad one of the things I really liked about this particular approach is you basically I already painted the uh, train black so then I went over it with some white paint and added some uh, light shades where I wanted it to appear like it was faded this particular train does still exist, fortunately. It's actually in a museum, um, but it's stored outside, obviously. So even though it's maintained, it's still wearing a little bit just from the elements. So I was able to get a pretty good idea by looking at photographs of the train in its present condition of where the, you know, where the areas are it would show um, fading and wear. So I tried to mimic that when I applied this black and white technique. One feature of the black and white technique that I, I really liked from the mix set was this product called Transparenter, which is probably sounds like a transformer. But anyway, um, Transparenter it's called. And basically it's a thinner for your paint, but it also adds some translucency to your paint. So the uh, black and white technique you've applied still shows through. Now you can get the same result by using just thinners and just really thinning down your uh, top coat. But this is definitely easier to work with than doing it that way. I have tried the other way and I got it working, but I really preferred this approach. Uh, I think this worked really well. So I was really impressed with this product, so much so that I've gone and bought a large bottle of it now. And in future projects, you know, the technique I've used here and I'm describing to you is one that I'll certainly consider for other models uh, where I think it'll, it'll work well. So anyway, I uh, used one color for the top and that's um, Tamiya's XF22 RLM Grey which is a really interesting colour it's not a deep dark grey which is like the uh, armour colour and it's not the bleach sort of lighter blue colour a lot of modellers sort of tint their greys to become more blue because it, they gain for the sort of the scale effect this has actually got a green hue to it so if a bit like the uniform colour actually basically um, so if you look at this in shadow, it actually does look grey, but if you get some direct sunlight on it, it starts to take on a bit of a green tone to it. So it's quite an interesting colour, and with this black and white technique, it works really well. And if you put it in the sunlight, it looks a very different model to if you're viewing it um, under artificial lights or you're viewing it uh, in shadow. So, yeah, very happy with the overall finish. I then went over the smaller details with some wash, um, trying to think what wash I used, it was one of the MIG uh, washes, it was just an aircraft wash and it was like a dark browny grey colour, so I just basically, I think it was a dark brown, and I just basically put that over the model, again fairly discreetly. When it came to the wear, um, I didn't do a lot of chipping on this, on this train because um, back in a previous life, when I was a young bloke, my first job out of school, I worked for a number of years with the railways here in Australia, and chipping wasn't 
as big an issue as it seems to be portrayed in a lot of the um, weathering I see online. So basically, uh, chipping typically only happened around areas where there were loose objects, like chains, for example. But the more common type of wear was where there was foot traffic. So if you had the crews climbing up and down or walking along particular areas of the train, what effectively happened over time was they would wear through the paint. And uh, because they were going backwards and forwards all the time, the, paint, the bare metal, whether it's aluminium or steel, didn't get a chance to actually um, oxidise. So what you ended up with instead was a really highly polished surface which is quite the opposite of what um, I see portrayed on a lot of tanks where, they, where people are trying to show a lot of foot traffic. So what I did on this was a few spots, which you'll see in the photographs. Um, I'll put one up now. You'll see I put some very subtle um, silver finish on some of the uh, step ladders and things like that just to represent that uh, people have been going up and down them. And a little bit of chipping just towards the front of the train where the, the buffers are and the uh, screw coupling is. A little hint of it on some of the ladders, but not a lot. I kept that really to a minimum. But overall, I was pretty happy with the finish. It's subtle, but that's probably more the style I like to do in my modelling anyway. So I was reasonably happy with that. The only thing I haven't put on the model at this stage is any sort of sign of diesel on the roof of the, uh, of the train. And that's just because I still haven't figured out how it might look. Different diesel trains actually do actually put different patterns on the top of trains. So I'm going to have to try and find an example of a uh, German, early German diesel locomotive to get an idea of how uh, the exhaust um, used to vent out of them and how it used to travel over the top of the roof. And then I'll, I'll put a bit of black on it at that point. But at the moment, I'm, I'm happy with it just the way it is anyway. Um, for the track bed, I also applied some, um, some scenic materials on there. Initially, that was a bit of a disaster for me, so I had to go to the hobby store and find some more materials. And uh, I used some of the Tamiya's new like scenic grass. So I'll put a picture of that up now for you so you can see what the bottle looks like. And the one I got was fairly old, but I was able to um, get it a bit thinner by just using some X20A thinners. And that worked really well along the sides here, because this is actually just a, a piece of polystyrene, so I, I, I just put that along the side there. Um, to cover the edges and then I use some scatter materials that you can get from your um, hobby shop for HO or double O scale trains and I just basically laid that on the top. I tried not to make the ballast look too perfect because I wanted this to look like a train track that has not seen regular uh, maintenance for a few years because of the war. I mean obviously um, a lot of the railways right across the world were run down quite poorly by the end of the war because there just wasn't the men or the materials to um, focus on keeping them keeping them up. So basically for those few years they were neglected. Um, so I wanted to sort of represent that a little bit with the track. I didn't want it to look like it was um, in a siding necessarily, but I did want it to look like it was on a railway line that um, was needing a bit of um, attention. So that's pretty much all I've got to say about the kit. It is a fun kit. Um, it is a little bit tedious at times, particularly with the um, photo etch that you've got to apply here and there. But it's an unusual subject. It's, uh, if you are getting sick of building tank kits, for example, I think you're going to really enjoy this for a change of pace. And if you're someone that builds ships or planes or cars and you're looking for something a little bit different, um, I think this kit's going to certainly fit the bill there. I can't recall the price I paid for it, but I do know it was quite reasonably priced given the amount of plastic that comes in the kit and the size of the finished model. Um, if I can find the price, I'll pop that up on the video now for you. But overall, it was a fun kit, and I'm really happy with the finished product. I think it looks great. If you're a mad, mad keen on scratch building, the opportunities in this kit are enormous because unfortunately, you don't get any detail inside. There's no cab inside. There's no engines or anything like that. There's room for improvement um, in the underframe as well. But I'm not really complaining about any of that because, let's be honest, uh, this is a rather unusual subject and it wasn't that many years ago that we would never have had a mainstream manufacturer even think of making a kit like this. So the fact that Trumpeter have stepped up and made one for us and made it in the same scale as many of the other bits and pieces that you can you can get to make up a really cool diorama scene, like you can get figures and what have you. Um, it's, it's just awesome. So I'm really pleased that Trumpeter did it. 
and I think they did a pretty good job on representing what the model looks, uh, the train looks like um, from the photographs I've seen of uh, the real train, which is said is still in a museum. So overall, I am going to recommend this kit. It fits together nicely. It looks great when it's done. A little bit of tedium in some of the construction steps, but worth pushing through that to get the finished model. And overall, it's a really good kit, and I'm going to recommend it to you. Okay, so that's the end of our uh, review of the Trumpeter Armoured Train Kit. Um, I'm going to finish off the video just with a few still images so you can get a bit of a closer view of it in some nice um, light. And also, if you want to see some photographs of the construction of the train, you can find those on my blog. So if you want to go and have a look at www.vdlmodelbench.com So that's um, Van Diemen's Land Modelbench.com So that's VDL www.vdlmodelbench.com uh, You'll find some photographs there in the photo gallery section. I haven't actually um, ordered them or anything, but still, they could be useful to you if you're thinking about getting this kit and you just want to know a little bit more about what goes into making it. Thanks for watching. I hope you like this new uh, video format, if you like, where I'm sort of taking you through some of the kits I've built. If you think that's something you'd like to see more of, let me know in the comments. If you'd rather just watch me building them or just do product reviews, tell me that too. Um, but anyway, happy modeling, and I look forward to seeing what you're doing online. If you haven't done a video online, please do one. It's really awesome to get online and catch other people's work and see what they're doing. Uh, and as you can see from me, you don't have to be a professional about it. So anyway, guys, thanks for uh, watching the video, and I'll catch you on the next one.